Hello my beautiful watchers and welcome back to a series of unfortunate reviews where I, your humble adaptation critic host, struggle through the Netflix show based on a series of kids books I never really cared for. If you don't know or remember why, there's the thing. Okay, on to episodes 3 and 4 of season 2, based on book the 6th, The Ersatz Elevator. I don't think I'm going to be talking about anything outside of this book and episode this time, but I'm going to throw up a spoiler warning for the whole series anyway, just so you can't be mad at me if I accidentally blurt something out. In the loyal to the book category, we have Poe dropping the kids off at 667 Dark Avenue, the long climb up the stairs because the elevator is just too unfashionable to be used right now, Jerome, the nice but subservient new guardian, and Esme, the trend-obsessed sixth most important financial advisor in the city, not very nice guardian. Olaf pretending to be an in auctioneer, um, in and out being the buzzwords for fashionable and unfashionable. As usual, no adults being able to see through Count Olaf's disguise, the Baudelaire's realising there's something suspicious about the extra elevator a door at the top of the building, finding the quagmire triplets at the bottom of the empty elevator shaft, being told Olaf's plan is to smuggle them out of the city in an inn item that he's going to sell at the auction. By the way, I will swing back around to the various ways in which the plot of this book didn't make any gosh darn sense in a moment. Um, the Baudelaire's leaving to find a way to bust them out of the cage they were in, making the mistake of confiding everything in Esme, who subsequently pushes them back down the elevator shaft into a waiting net and reveals that she's in cahoots with Olaf. Sunny busting them out, the hidden underground tunnel that led to the burnt remains of their parents' mansion, thinking the cardboard box labelled VFD was where the quagmires were hidden, but that turning out to be a red herring to distract them from the literal red herring where the kids were really jammed inside, and the cold comfort of successfully outing Olaf by showing off his tattoo again. Okay, let's start with some positives, shall we? You know, a bit of positivity before I start complaining. I kind of dug the cinematography on this one. There was a lot of very effective vertical panning shots, and I've always really liked those. Bo Welch, the director, is one of several these shows cycles through every few episodes, and you might recognise his name because he's done some big movies too. I'm finding Lemony Snicket's non-diegetic interruptions less distracting this season, though that might just be because I'm finally getting used to them. Uh, plus, I'm still a big Patrick Wall Robertson fan, so that helps. Okay, I take back what I said in the last episode, not recasting the baby was a smart move. That little shitbag is still a really surprisingly good actress. I mean, either that or Welch just wasn't afraid to do like a million takes to get what she was doing exactly right. Moving from positives to just general observations, I've realised that every episode so far has had the same effect on me as an adaptation critic. Uh, you'd think I would have realised what they were doing before, what, episode fucking 12? Every pair of episodes starts out very book loyal, then looks like it's going completely, irreparably off the rails to the point where I don't even know how to begin deconstructing it, then inevitably somehow manages to get back on track right before the end, and it surprises me every time. It amused me to realise that because it happens this way every time, this deviation from the Handler formula is, in a way, Handler's new formula. That said, I would say this particular episode took more liberties with the details of the book stuff they stuck to, even by this series' usual standards, so it is less book loyal than average. The first lesson of the story, the often overlooked difference between nervous and anxious was carried over, which is educational, I guess. I must confess, I was surprised and mildly disturbed that the prune-flavoured ice cream versus live alligator dessert metaphor was given a full visual representation in the episode. Nothing says kid's story like Patrick Warburton casually ignoring an ice cream man's screams as he's eaten alive inside his own truck. In the book, I'm pretty sure the doorman was the hook-handed man all along and the orphans just didn't recognise him in an unusual bout of gullibility for them, but the show obviously couldn't get away with that, so they brought in someone new at first and then axed him off in the second part of the episode which... Yeah, I guess that works. Right from the start, this new version of Jerome seems much more aware that his wife is kind of awful than his book counterpart. Uh, instead of being completely naively unaware of almost everything going on around him, they're sort of going for a smiling through the pain sort of thing. Uh, ah, life is hell and my wife's a mean-spirited bully. Would you like a drink? Reality is also being bent more than usual in these episodes too, it seems, as there's apparently a paperboy riding around on a space-folding bicycle. These showrunners have always shown a very high level of awareness that Neil Patrick Harris is by far the best part of every episode, but I am noticing a descending level of subtlety in the way they're making sure he gets more and more screen time. I mean, in this episode there wasn't even the pretense that he wasn't going to be the centre of attention all the way through. The episode starts and, whoa, okay, he was behind the curtains. Well, he's here already, let's just go with it. Okay, so as I hinted before, I have a few issues with the plot of this book. There were some holes in it that just stood out too much, even in this intentionally illogical world that Handler created. For example, Olaf's plan to pretend to be an inn auctioneer, putting the triplets inside an inn item and having one of his henchmen bid on it so they can smuggle the quagmires out of the city and then come back for the Baudelaire's, who Esme will have trapped in a net in an elevator shaft just before the auction. If it's so hard to smuggle the quagmires out of the city, then why did he bring them to the city in the first place? The school he took them from 
bombs in the arse end of nowhere, and there was no reason for him to take them with him when he came to make his latest attempt on the Baudelaire's. He could have left them with one of his henchmen. Why did there need to be an auction involved for him to put the quagmires inside a large object and put that object in his car? That seems like an unnecessary way to add as many witnesses to his crime as possible. Why was his plan to leave the Baudelaire's in a net during the auction and then come back for them afterwards when he could so easily have put them in an in item too and taken all five kids at once? And if Esme was in on the plan the whole time and clearly hated her husband, why not just kill Jerome and take the kids without all the facade? Fortunately, the show noticed and tried its best to address some of these issues. Firstly, by introducing a citywide manhunt for Olaf, which apparently caught him unawares mid-scheme and forced him to hide the quagmires in the building on short notice. They even thought to add a reason for the Baudelaire's not to take advantage of this and call the police on him as soon as he shows up, as he mentions that the quagmire triplets are hidden so well they would almost certainly starve to death if he went to jail and didn't come back for them. They also show that killing Jerome was indeed Olaf's plan A, and that he also tried to arrange a snatch job at a fake restaurant next before setting up the net in the elevator shaft plan. However, this unfortunately uncovers some plot holes of its own, because once it's revealed that Esme was in on it all along, it no longer makes any sense that Olaf gave up on his murder plan when he couldn't make it look like an accident and didn't just stab Jerome with his cane knife, and why Esme completely ruined his fake restaurant idea by insisting they go somewhere else and joining in on the request for a musical number that kept Olaf trapped there and away from the apartment while the VFD searched it for the Kragmires. The ridiculously oversized pinstripe suits now fit the Baudelaire's perfectly, I'm assuming because of the impracticality of expecting the kids to act through the whole episode in clothing that doesn't fit them. There's still more surprisingly dirty innuendos in a show based on kids books than I would have expected, but I guess that shows that they are aware that their target audience isn't so much kids as people who enjoyed these books as kids who are now grown up, monthly subscription paying adults. I noticed that they fell into the occasional classic adaptation issue here and there in this one too. Uh, for example, in the book the orphans search the massive, massive penthouse because they thought that Olaf might be hiding in there somewhere because the doorman said he never left the building. In the show, Olaf is with them at this point. Violet is apparently looking for the quagmire triplets because Olaf hinted they were nearby, but to assume that means they're in the apartment with them is a bit of a stretch and, to be honest, just a kind of poor setup for what was clearly intended to be a visually amusing sequence. In a related issue, the absence of the mystery of where Olaf was and how he vanished without leaving the building makes the elevator revelation come pretty much out of nowhere. This is exacerbated by them leaving out the part in the book where the orphans go down each floor one by one, listening in on every door in the building to see if Olaf was in another apartment. I mean, Jack Snick and his new friend are now the ones checking the building, but that's neither here nor there because they never communicate with or share information with the Baudelaire's. So yeah, in the show there's absolutely no reason that I could see that Klaus would realise that the elevator was ersatz even if someone did say a keyword to him. Also, ye gods, I might have liked the directing, but the editing in this episode was kind of appalling at times. I mean, the light bulb moment with Mrs. Poe was so poorly handled it kind of blew my mind a little bit. 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 I was just thinking to myself that if I had to hear that bloody quote about it being hard to stick to one's principles in a world full of blah blah blah, one more time I was going to punch someone and they went ahead and repeated it verbatim twice in rapid succession, literally as I was thinking that. I mean, the fact that it's mentioned that it's coming up a lot is not making it any less irksome for me. Annoying on purpose is still annoying. So I can kind of understand being willing to hang out with Nathan Fillion while he explains the underground struggles of two warring secret societies and offers to initiate you into one of them, but I have to say it is a bit of a jump to immediately go from that to, okay, let's dress up in leather and scale the outside of a building together. Also, why in the name of all that is holy would she put on high heels specially to do this? I mean, shame on you, Jack Snicket, for not providing her with appropriate footwear. Everyone knows high heels are for running away from T-Rexes, not climbing skyscrapers. And not for nothing, but no one in this crowded, well-lit city noticed these two Batman and Robining their way up a skyscraper? I mean, during a city-wide manhunt for a known murderer and kidnapper? Something that's been bothering me since the beginning of this whole thing. Olaf proved right from the start that he has no qualms about killing, you know, Gustav, Montgomery, Josephine, but he never does in Larry your waiter despite multiple opportunities to do so and no reason not to. My working theory for the end of the first of the two episodes that made up this adaptation is Neil Patrick Harris wanted more musical numbers and even though they already used that to end the first season, no one wanted to argue with their biggest name. I had mixed feelings about them using a DIY parachute and or hot air balloon to descend the ersatz elevator shaft instead of a rope and the resulting fiery shenanigans. On one hand it seems like one of their many pointless and weirdly unrealistic changes away from the book, but on the other hand the multiple long extended descriptions in the book about them climbing up and down this rope kind of failed to capture what I'm assuming was the desired atmosphere for me, so it ended up just being really dull. You do have to wonder though, what the fuck was their plan for getting back up? I mean there's a good 
chance they might have all died of starvation at the bottom of an empty elevator shaft if they hadn't met the triplets there and been given a spyglass-style James Bond gadget that for some reason wasn't taken off them by Count Olaf. I was mildly annoyed by all the eye motifs dotted around the building. Now, you might be thinking, no the Dom, you sexy British Adonis. That makes perfect sense. There's a lot of evidence in the books and the companion pieces that Handel have released later that 667 Dark Avenue was a VFD safe house, which would explain the secret passageway to the Baudelaire's mansion. To which I respond, yeah, I know, that's why it's so dumb. What the hell sort of idiotic secret society plasters its logo all over its hidden safe houses? It also makes it kind of weird that the orphans weren't more distrustful of their new guardians, considering they live surrounded by the same design that's tattooed on Olaf's ankle. So, while I have voiced many issues in the past about the actor playing Klaus, and I still say he's the weakest link in the cast, I have to concede that, fuck me, he really can do a convincing scream of abstract terror, and that's actually a surprisingly rare thing. I mean, We've all heard Tom Cruise try to do it. I was wondering if they were going to expand on the Esme Grr, Beatrice stole something from me thing, but apparently they decided to keep it at the same level of vague as before. I really didn't get anything out of the overly long dance sequence with Esme and Olaf. Uh, I also noticed that this was the second time that Olaf has spurned the advances of a woman the show has changed to be inexplicably attracted to him. If it weren't for the early hints about his attraction to Violet, I'd probably start to think that they were making him asexual or actively sex negative in this. In regards to the list of things I've ever wanted to see. Freaky, nightmare-inducing CGI baby descending down out of the blackness from above like an infantile Batman is not, and has never been, on it. I guess I just assumed that Jack Snicket and the librarian were going to be this season's quagmire parents when they teamed up, you know, around doing things but having absolutely zero impact on the main plot, but no, they actually burst into the room at the end and tried to help the Baudelaire's in plain sight, so it's going to be really weird if the orphans don't mention them ever again. Jerome standing up for himself at least a little bit at the end works in the context of his story arc in this episode, but it does fly in the face of his forever passive book character. The bit where everyone shouts out a random fact about themselves before bidding on the VFD box was one of several jokes that landed a bit flat for me. I mean, I just couldn't see what was supposed to be funny about that, but uh, I guess there's been several failed attempts at humour like that since the start of this show, so it's not really surprising. One thing I was quite impressed that they managed to recapture in the show was the fact that Jerome choosing to abandon them rather than help them find the quagmires was clearly way more hurtful hurtful to the Baudelaire's than Esme's straight-up betrayal. In conclusion, I'm starting to worry that in addition to being a complete reboot to the books, this show is really starting to prioritise quirky over any sort of substance, with more and more scenes appearing to exist solely to give some of the cast a chance to overact, and others to do bizarre, nonsensical things while remaining completely deadpan. Even though I don't personally care for these books, I still have enough experience with doing what I do to know that if an adaptation starts to forget why it exists in the first place, i.e. it's recreating something very popular in another the medium, and that original thing was probably popular for a reason, then it almost always ends rather badly. Time will tell if this will be the unfortunate end to this series of events, I guess. Thank you for joining me, my beautiful watchers, and don't forget to like, share, subscribe, and do all those other things that stop my channel from falling into algorithm-related obscurity. See you soon. Hello my beautiful watchers, and thanks for sticking around until the other YouTubers you might like segment. Today I'm recommending That Movie Chick. As the name implies, she's a movie critic. Her speciality is somewhat informal, unscripted sounding thoughts on new releases. Obviously not a groundbreaking format, but she does bring enough unique and insightful perspective on each subject that I think she stands out over the many other shows like it. She's very good at pointing out the pros and cons about films that you might have subconsciously noticed but couldn't quite put your finger on, which is remarkably cathartic. In addition, she also covers older movies occasionally and does other film theory related discussions and reviews. As usual, the relevant links are in the video description. Do check out her channel if you're looking for new talent to follow.